pokušat ću objasniti zbog čega imamo takve probleme danas sa povjerenjem, ali, pošto mi je bilo rečeno da govorim na engleskom, I'm moving now to English, and uh, what is the problem with communication in health sector and in society as a whole? And why are we today faced with a substantial problem which is really starting to complicate everybody's life? Communicators, but also decision makers and society as a whole. First of all, this is the society in which we were born, majority of us here. At least I was born in this society, <laughs> in modern era, in which after the invention of the printed press, society substantially changed in a way that it was possible to start reproduce ideas, findings in high quantities. Before the invention of the printed press, monks at monasteries have to write, rewrite, reproduce everything by hand. Standardization was nearly impossible. So the invention of the printed press invented modern era. We had to in book ourselves, literally. So our languages were able to standardize themselves because it was possible to reproduce these translations in high quantities. That's how modern nations emerged. Today we have nations which were able to in book themselves, literally, at the right time. It is extremely important to understand that this in bookment, the special role of the books, the special role of how we were educated and how we were trained to verify truth has tremendous effects on the whole modernity and to the era in which we are entering now. Truths which were reproduced in books was very strongly backed by governments. If you look how modern states emerged, you can see that one of the first things that every new nation, every new country does is form a National Academy of Sciences and Arts. And if you want to professionally work in health sector, for example, if you want to be a doctor, it is extremely important that you are prepared to follow the pre-described rules of how do you become a physician. If you want to be a physician, what do you have to do? You have to study first at the medical faculty, which is licensed by the government, by the way. Then you have to do specialization. Then you have to get a license from the medical association, the Association of Physicians. But they are giving you this license because the government authorized them to do so. If you are not prepared to practice medicine as it is, accepted through official doctrine, you are going to lose the license and you are not, be, not going to be able to practice medicine anymore, and if you will try to do it anyway, government will put you away. You're going to be arrested. That's the final thing that can happen. So the truth that the official medicine is practicing is backed by the government power. That's important point to understand. Now what's what has changed now from this literal world where truths are in booked in books, the internet has changed practically everything. In the world of internet, we are now seeing a second disenchantment with the world, as I would call it. The first disenchantment has happened with the printed book. Before the books were printed, and because of the high volume of reproduction, they were able to be translated in national languages. The role of Catholic Church completely changed at the end of the Middle Ages and with the emergence of the books. Why? Because people were able to read, to read holy truths. Until then, you need somebody who was able to read in Latin and tell you what's happening. Once people were able to start reading themselves, what we got in Europe? Reformation. And the Reformation brought 
nearly 200 of years of religious wars in Europe. It was a complete mess. But this mess meant, among other things, disenchantment with the Holy Truth, which also brought the division between the state and the church as a normal operation, as we know it in Western civilization. Now, so this was the first disenchantment. What's happening now with the internet is the second disenchantment. And this, this second disenchantment is disenchantment with the science. Science, similarly as medicine, medicine as a part of science, is basically government-backed. There are so many professions you can practice only if you get a government license. And the basic idea is that people should trust science. And we should trust what is generally accepted within scientific circles. Our problem is that we are trusting less and less. First of all, the traditional scientific truths were always professed ex cathedra. You know, the term ex cathedra is actually coming from the papal language. It's the Pope who is professing ex cathedra truths, religious truths. That's what professors actually do at universities, you know. We have cathedra, we stand there, and we profess scientific truths. And students should learn to reproduce what we tell them. The problem is that that's not true anymore. None of us here really believes in science anymore. And let me give you an example, which is coming directly from the medical field. If we get sick, what do we do? Exactly, we Google it. We don't go to the doctor anymore first. We first Google it, then we go to the doctor, if we think we should. And now we are Googling it, tomorrow we, we are going to chat GPT it. But basically, this is the medium of truth for us today. So all of us first go to Google, check what could be wrong with us, and a lot of us go to doctor, tell him or her what's wrong with us, and what we want from them. And this is completely changing the relationship between the doctor and the patient. Completely. It's making physicians nervous. It's complicating their lives. It has all kinds of problems for them. But generally, we can say, we are trusting scientists and experts less and less. While at the same time, we are living in a world in which we are becoming more and more dependent on them. And, uh, and uh, Corona was a good example of that. It was Michael Go. Michael Go Michael is a very important British politician. He was very powerful during the Brexit debates, who said on television, he said, I think people of this country have had enough of experts. In the middle of the Brexit debate on television, there were economists explaining why Brexit is bad for the UK, how it's going to affect the UK economy, what is, how it's going to affect uh, the, the whole British society. And he said that. Go to hell with experts. Who needs them? We have our own opinions, we are going to express our opinions, and we are going to vote based on our opinions. Full stop. We are living in a society which is really ending modernity. This is not postmodern society. We are beyond postmodern. We are now talking about hypermodern society where everything is hype today. We have hyperglobalization. I'll return to that, but it's going beyond movement of people, goods, and services. It's actually everything is moving globally very fast, and no matter whether there is a new Cold War starting now between the US and China, this glo globalization is unstoppable. We have hyper-complexity, which is complicating our lives beyond our beliefs, because when you enter the era of hyper-complexity, normal, 
standard models of, models of science don't work anymore. And we are, have entered hypermodernity, which is obvious in the way how we have all become hyper-narcissistic. We all are all the time looking at ourselves. It's really a me-first world in which our pictures on social media are more important than our physical life. We have entered hyper-democracy. If you talk to the people, they are going to say, my opinion counts. Even if I have no knowledge. Remember how debates were going all, all around the globe during the COVID. Who cares about physicians? Who cares if they have spent studying six year uh, specialization, I don't know, another four years, if they are doing it for past 20, 30 years, all of their studies, all of their uh, uh, experience doesn't count anything. It equals my opinion, which I formed based on what I read on the internet and what I have discussed with my friends. And that's it. That's how we, how we operate. And we have entered the very funny phase of hyperconsumption in which it is cheaper to buy, wear, and throw away clothes than to wash them. You, you can get a, a lot of things so cheap that it's actually cheaper to make a dump out of them than to reuse them while everybody is talking about the green uh, transition. What is the environment in which we, which we live today? First of all, we really have transplanetary relations. People are communicating all the time. And if we, if we think about our kids, my kids were first socialized on the internet, and their first language is actually English, not the national languages and countries in which they live. And they are beep at reads because they have Slovenian and Croatian uh, citizenship. But for them, the globe is the world. They don't care where they are. They're all the time connected to something else. But not only we live globally, the younger generation, also viruses, as we have seen, live globally. It took them actually two months to cover the whole globe for, for, uh, uh, for the COVID-19. Between, I'm saying it has happened between our European Christmas and the Chinese New Year. Why in Bergamo? Because Bergamo is the main hub for Chinese flights to Northern Italy. They were flying up and down all the time, but by the time we figured out what's going on, virus was here. And we cannot stop them. We know that new viruses and new diseases will come, and they will only come faster. There is no way that we have any idea how to prevent the move faster. So we are actually globalized on uh, transplanetary relations. And we are actually experiencing what some are calling super, uh, super territoriality. We live in globalized space in which we communicate simultaneously and instantaneously. What it means? Instantaneously means that when we communicate, our messages are wherever practically at the same time. We have Teams meetings, we have Zoom meetings, we have WebEx meetings, and we are all around the globe as if we are physically present. So communication goes extremely fast. And it's happening at different platforms at the same time. You can sit in front of your desktop computer, and talk via Teams, while at the same time you're using your smartphone, your iPad, your laptop, all channels at the same time. And this communication can actually uh, uh, be parallel uh, instantaneously as we are communicating. And it's interesting to know that although uh, autocratic regimes are spending obscene amount of money to install different types of digital worlds and, and to contain their populations, it doesn't work. I have a Chinese doctoral student who is uh, uh, studying with me in Ljubljana now, uh, and when she arrived finally, after two years of bureaucratic procedures, 
I was asking her, okay, you live in China, there are all kinds of walls, some of social media are not uh, uh, available to you there. How, how do you communicate with the world? How do you understand what's going on? She says, government is spending money on completely useless things. We, the youth, know how to go around these walls all the time. Communication is not a problem at all. So, this, plan this planetary communication has very interesting implications for all kinds of things. One of those were, we were all shocked that big migrations started from Northern Africa and Middle East towards our territory when we figured out that migrants are using smartphones to navigate. And their navigation is real time. So they know which route to take, they know where the border guards are moving, they know what to say, they have pre-prepared uh, uh, documents and things like that. So we, we are really living not in a global village anymore. I'm saying now we are living in a living room together where we are present in each other's lives all the time. And some things are coming out of that which are extremely positive. For example, think about robotic telemedicine. No, you can have a surgeon being in one country, operation happening in another country. There are all kinds of positive things which are going to come out of that, but they are changing the way we experience this world. As I said, the world is hyper-complex. The VUCA is acronym in English now, which is uh, commonly used. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and um, uh, ambiguous. But what does that mean for informed consent? You know, the doctrine of treatment of patients generally accepted now in Western societies is that you need informed consent of the patient for any kind of treatment. I've spent several years on, on different research projects in Slovenia uh, dealing with uh, vaccination, uh, particularly of vaccination of uh, young children against communicative uh, diseases. And I, we found out that majority of young pediatricians are saying, look, I have to work within the framework of the informed consent, but I'm not sure I understand what I'm, I'm to tell them. I'm not quite sure that all pieces fit together. And you have all kinds of skepticism and second top, uh, thoughts developing within the uh, medical establishment, which we also saw, uh, saw during the uh, COVID era. As I said, we have come in a very strange, hyper-modern world in which we all, not only Donald Trump, think that it's about us first. No, it's America first, it's Croatia first, it's me first. We all believe that our selves are more important than anything else. And let me give you a very simple example uh, at, at the, in the territory of uh, child vaccination. It is completely rational today in Slovenia not to vaccinate your child against any kind of communicative disease. Why? How can you rationally defend it? I'm not going to vaccinate my child. Why could it be rational? On the individual level, it's actually perfectly rational because the level of vaccination in Slovenia is above 95%. When you have vaccination above 95%, that disease is very unlikely to happen. So, your child is safe as long as he or she is in Slovenia, and not only that, we all know that there are side effects of vaccination to a certain percentage of population. So actually, by not vaccinating my child, I'm preventing a possibility that some kind of side effect will appear, while well, my child is safe, on the individual level. On the societal level, this is eroding the protection. So what we are seeing in the field of vaccination, of child vaccination, for example, is that probably the most successful 
policy in the field of public health, which was extremely successful, probably the most successful thing that has ever happened in our civilization, is actually undermining its own success. Because general population doesn't know, don't know these diseases anymore, and physicians have no experience with these diseases anymore. So a level of fear is actually going down as a side result of that is, why should we care? So you can find, and I will tell you at the end who are these uh, parents who are saying, my child is not going to be vaccinated, full stop. It's not safe and it's not necessary. So that's one problem. Hyper-democracy I've mentioned. With smartphones, we don't care how long physicians have studied, what kind of experience they have, how old they are, what they have done. I am prepared to defend my opinion based on whatever I think is right. The internet, friends, and you can see the debates about what was happening during the uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemics. These debates are still going on and we can enter into that uh, at any time, if you wish. And what is also very important, we are now seeing hyper consumption in the field of health as well. We all want it now, and we all want it all, which is simply unsustainable. Because today, pharmaceutical industry and other related industries can offer us so many beneficial things that there, it does, there is no society which is rich enough to be able to provide everything which is available to everybody in real time. If we want to have our health sector sustainable, we should be able to bring in some logic into its operations, meaning that not everything is urgent. We all know the general trick which is used both in Croatia and Slovenia. If you have a problem getting to a physician, what you do, you, what you do, you go to ER. It's free and it's fast. And you get the treatment you need, which is undermining the whole sector, basically. So we are going to have all kinds of problems because people don't understand the big picture anymore. And they don't care about big picture. If somebody told you 40, 50 years ago, your condition is not so problematic. We can treat you in the next several months or even in a couple of years. You wouldn't mind standing in line. Today, nobody. We all want it now. And we all want it as good as it could be. Which, will, which is bringing all kinds of problems. These are some of the tools which are generally available to us. This is all me, you see on the picture. These are some of the gadgets I have. And you can read down here what all these gadgets do to me. So, I know about my weight, body mass index, whole body consumption plus fat and muscle mass, basal metabolic rate, pulse wave velocity, vascular age, standing heart rate, steps, heart rate, ECG, blood oxygen uh, uh, level, sleep. I don't have menstrual cycle, but my wife can check also that. Uh, then I have the, uh, I can monitor my sugar level, although I'm not a diabetic, I do it for fun, so that I know how different kinds of food affect me. It's crazy on one side. As I said, this is the type of hyper-democratization. We can do all these things to ourselves. But on the other side, if you think closely about it, if all this data would be immediately transferred also to my central uh, 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 medical folder and my physician could access those data, he or she should, treat, should be able to treat me much better than based on results they get from one examination, general examina examination I do once a year. So this is going to have tremendous effects on the other side, you know where? in the insurance industry. Because it's only a question of time, and actually some insurance companies already do it in, in, in a very limited uh, 
uh, level. If an insurance, if I would agree to give this data or some of this data to the insurance company, which is dealing with my, my health insurance, they could say, look, if you are prepared to lose some weight, so you are going to have your weight between this and these limits. If you are prepared your cholesterol level between these limits, limits uh, triglycerides between these limits, sugar below that, and may maybe one or two more indicators, we are prepared, prepared to give you a bonus. The same way we are giving you bonus for your car. So, if you are healthy, and if you are not engaged with uh, adrenaline sports, your cost, your cost for us is much lower than somebody else who is not living healthy. So, let's deal with it. And how we are going to deal with it? With differentiated pricing. It's just around the corner, trust me. It's just a matter of years. And as I said, some, some uh, insurance companies uh, uh, outside, at least in Slovenia, I'm not aware of any that, that is doing it at that level, but it's coming. And as a final result of all that, what do we have around us? I would say our major problem is now becoming health hyperliteracy. And what I mean between, with hyperliteracy? The general idea of communication, of health communication, has always been based on the so-called information deficit model. So, if we educate people about risks, if we educate them about proper ways of behavior, they will follow our advice and they will live healthier lives. Okay? So, unhealthy behaviors of population are a result of their ignorance. Okay? That's the general idea. And all health communication campaigns are starting with this position. So we have to explain to people why they should do this, why they should, in COVID times, why they should wear masks, why they should vaccinate, why they should isolate, uh, why they should do this, why they should do that. So we have to educate that, we have to provide them information, and if we, they will have enough information, if they will understand it, if they will, they will internalize it, they will behave correctly. Or let's put it in a better way, they will make better health choices for themselves. This is not exactly the truth. One of the results of a mass, big study we have done in Slovenia has found out that the, one of the major problems of child vaccination against communicative diseases in Slovenia is not ignorance, but it's empowerment. We have now isolated islands. We have even connected to some of the schools where you have a high incidence of unvaccinated children. And in Ljubljana, one of such hubs is the Waldorf school. Now, whose children go to Waldorf school? Parents are better educated, they have higher income, and they feel more empowered. The final result of better education, better resources, and higher empowerment is me first. My child doesn't have to be vaccinated. It's not natural. It's not necessary. So I will not vaccinate my child. So, problems that we are now facing with levels of trust in society and in the medical system and in science in general are not problems of ignorance anymore. The whole modern society was based on the idea of enlightenment. You have to bring the light to the people, you have to educate the people, you have to help them develop their full intellectual potentials, and when they will do so, they will be able to make better choices for themselves. Unfortunately, it is not so. 
And our problem today is that we have started thinking about how to communicate and how to operate in a world which has literally left modernity. And for me as a communicator, I think this is a, a very lucrative era because we will need more communication. We will need more hands-on because high tech, which is driving all these changes, really need high touch as well. And uh, uh, in this major study that we have done on vaccination, what we have found out is that generally, nearly half of the people doesn't trust science anymore. Over half of the population doesn't trust the medical system anymore. Health system, the whole set health, national health system. But what they do trust is their individual physicians. So it's back to human, to human communication. And this is a big challenge that we are going to face. Thank you very much. I've left some time for, for questions. I think that uh, we, we, you, you can never change the times in which you live. So if I'm, you don't see, let me read the question, you don't see. How should the health sector approach the problem of us living in post-truth society? Should we embrace it or fight against it? I would say problems of post-truth are linked to what I was explaining just uh, minutes uh, ago. So we literally live in a world in which the status of science is changing. And all of us are becoming more questioning. Actually, now after the COVID era is gone, we have to admit, all of us, that our health authorities and our governments were doing all kinds of stupid things during the COVID. I mean, luckily my family lives in Croatia, not in Slovenia, because Slovenia was twice worse than Croatia, with limiting freedom of movement, with children being close to their homes, without being able to school, but not only that, not being able to go out in, the, in, in normal life and so on and so forth. But we all know now that majority of restrictions were not necessarily useful. You have big debates now in the United States about how Florida was dealing with COVID and the rest of the United States and what's the difference in mortality, additional mortality there. Or if you want Sweden in Europe and some more restrictive countries like Slovenia, you can see that many of those things didn't make sense. So all of this is actually opening questions. So we were using the smartest people we had. We had the best scientists, and we have the top government authorities telling us all those stupid things. I don't know if you remember, at the beginning, we were washing everything we bought in stores. In Slovenia, you had to uh, wash holders in buildings. So they were washing all kinds of stupid things. So all of that starts in the next, when the next pandemic comes, you know, people are going to be even more skeptical. We know that they don't know quite exactly what they're saying. And this will have very interesting uh, consequences. So this is reality around us. The only option here is actually more communication, more open communication. That's the, big, the biggest difference. There is no ex cathedra truths anymore. There, it's impossible for anybody to go on television and say, look, I've been dealing with this for past 30 years, I have completed all studies that there are in this field, and I know what I'm saying. The only option today is, I think, is, look, I've been working on this for past 30 years, I have completed all the studies, I'm in touch with my colleagues around the world, and honestly, I think 
this is what should we all do. We should protect ourselves. It may be even a little bit overblown at the moment, but I have no better idea. So let's figure out how to get through this crisis and how to deal with it. The problem is that at the moment, we don't trust any kind of authorities, not only scientific authorities. And that's a huge problem. That's a huge problem between Sweden and us. In Sweden, public officials can go on television and say something, and majority of people trust them. Here, where you see a politician saying something, you are, by definition, going to do the opposite. And that's, that's a huge problem. So we have to face this post-truth society, because this post-truth society is here to stay, and it's going to get even more complicated. So we have to be more engaged, more communicating, more... Uh, uh, we will have to invest more of the human side also. Because science always allowed scientists and officials actually to stay behind the, their masks. You know, I'm a scientist, I'm a doctor. This is what I say. I can tell that to my students always. I'm always right. If you don't agree with me, you'll see you're great at the end of the course. But it's, it, it's changing. Then, kako se boriti protiv hyperdemocratization of medicine? You can't. Hyper-democratization of medicine is here to stay. And I think we are in front of a huge revolution in, in medicine, which is, of course, there, there is going to be a lot of corrective medicine here to stay, but I think we are in front of a major uh, revolution towards preventive medicine. Because our health systems are financially unviable as they are built at the moment. As I mentioned, new technologies, new knowledge which is coming in is uh, enabling more treatments that we are able to finance. And who is going to make the choices? This child will get the treatment and that child is not going to get the treatment. And then we all collect some stupid, you know, uh, things so that we we get some money so that a, a child can go to United States for some kind of treatment and things like this. Well, as I said, why this one, why not that one? Well, on the other side, the only option we have available is to put more pressure on ourselves. So technology is going to allow us to do a lot of what physicians are doing at the moment. And I believe we are going to see a kind of a Chinese turnaround in a sense that we should be paying for doc, uh, to our f personal physicians for the time when we are healthy, not for the time when we are sick. And I think hyper-democratization should be seen as something that is going to have positive effects on, the, on society, but it's true. It's going to substantially change the social role of physicians. It's a completely different ballgame now. It's not, you know, the holy doctor uh, you know, I have to bring you a half of the pig and I don't know what because I depend on you. It's, it's going to change substantially this relationship. Možemo li kako sačuvati zdravi razum u cjelokupnoj hyperdemokratizaciji i konzumaciji svega što nas okružuje? Zašto ne? I think we are living with common sense all the time. And actually a lot of what's happening against, uh, around us is against common sense. So we should be able to use both scientific knowledge and common sense at the same time. I mean, there is no common sense for airplanes to fly, as far as I'm concerned. I cannot explain that with common sense. So we are humans, and we are able to uh, meddle through, I would say. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not so much concerned. I, that's why I'm saying I'm the person from the library. My kids don't know what library is, physical library. So I know I'm previous, I'm, I'm from the previous century. My daughter says me from time to time, you're so last century. I am. And several of us are here. So how should the teaching of medical students change and who will have the ball to change it? That's a very good uh, point. I, I think that particularly for medical uh, studies, um, my view on med medical education at the moment is that the medical study is one of the most solitary studies there is. 
you have to be prepared to work very hard as a student. You have to study a lot. You have to stand reading books late in the evening while your other student colleagues are having fun. They are having fun. But the problem is, when you finish your studies, you're not, your soft skills are not necessarily on the same level than soft skills of those people who are partying all the time. And I think that for medical education, soft skills, education in soft skills, communication, communication with patients, communication, intra-organizational communication within medical institutions, my, my private theory is that more people actually die during operations because of bad communication between people who are handling the thing that, than because of their uh, medical knowledge. So communication, interpersonal communication, organizational communication, and societal communication is going to become one of the most important things doctors have to master. And in that sense, uh, I hope also the whole medical system will change so that physicians get, again, enough time to deal with patients, because what does it matter if you know how to communicate, but you have five minutes or seven minutes to deal with the patient. So it's, it's going to be a tremendous change in the whole system, I think, because there is no other way that the system can survive. It needs to actually turn itself around on its head. Thank you.